for a while now. I've been having this dream. In this dream, I'm not whole. I've been torn apart by something I can't quite comprehend. Split apart, not organically, but with brute force. I, as I exist, am doomed to the fate of being an observer, unable to interact with what I'm watching. A girl in a lighthouse overlooking a clay doll representation of humanity. While those I observe can move between spaces, I am assigned to this space. All of this is to say, if I am between the binary and ternary, and she is on the binary, what does that make you? <coughs> I look up from my phone as Allison walked into the room, slumped over. She walked over and face planted onto the bed I was sitting on. I look at her inquisitively. What's got you all tuckered out? Mm. I lean over and poke her hair. Sit up, Ali. I can't make up a word you're saying. Allison sat up. Packing. The same thing we've been doing all day. Well, speak your yourself. I finished up pretty early, actually. Yeah, because you don't have anything to pack. All your stuff is still back at home on the island. Hey, don't fault me for being like way to travel. I don't need much to get by. You are the one that had like everything stripped from Tanegashima. Alison glared at me with an unserious, tired expression. Yeah, and I realize now how bad of an idea that was. Because now I have to get it all shipped back. Such is the struggle with a temporary home. Sure is. How about you? You already packed everything up? Yeah, did it this afternoon. Didn't really take too long, like I say. Maybe I should loosen up a little. I'm admittedly a little envious of your single carry-on suitcase. Huh, <laughs> well, it suddenly makes traveling easier. But I'd be lying if I say I didn't miss my home back in on Tanegashima. So take that as you will. <laughs> Fair enough. Just then a rather tall silhouette appeared in the doorway. Hey, Kotomi, what's up? Kotomi walked into the room. Nothing much, just making sure that you're both ready to be up early tomorrow for the taxi to the airport. Everything already? Yep. I know you're ready, Sad. I was mainly talking to Allison. Yeah, I just finished up. All the stuff that's getting shipped back is in the boxes of my front door, and my suitcases are in my room. Cool, cool. Eddie and I also just finished packing. Don't stay up too late. We gotta be up at 8 a.m. sharp tomorrow. You got it! Kotomi left the room and closed the door behind her leaving Allison and I in the light of the dim desktop lamp on the dresser. Allison looked over at my phone in my hand. What were you doing? I turned on the phone to review the game I've been playing, putting in some of the grind on noise sun life, trying to clear that chapter 5 update that just came out. Allison gave a light-hearted chuckle. <laughs> oh, I should have known. I felt a light impact against my side and looked over to see Allison resting her head on my shoulder. I gave her a teasing smile. You want to rest? Your head on my lap. Alison moved away from me. Flushed her. Whoa, 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 I, I, I mean, I, I, was, I just uh, was like, You want to rest your hand on my lap? Alison buried her face in her knees. Yeah. I put my legs down off the bed and let Alison lay down on my lap. I looked down at her, still flustered, with her eyes closed. Hey, hey, you can fall asleep there, you know? You can stop me. I can revoke your lap privileges, but you won't. I laughed softly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I guess you are the sleeping beauty then, huh? Alison opened her eyes. If that makes you my prince, I'll say I got pretty lucky. I... Why did this come the literal cutest human being alive? Oh, uh, well, well, that's too far? Um, sorry. No, no, it's okay. I'm just not ready for that. An awkwardly long silence passes. Hey, I want to ask. Are you okay? You seem kinda out of it all day. I guess you do know me too well for that to go unnoticed, huh? I guess it's not so much that I'm out of it, and more so that it really feels like this time, short as it was, is coming to an end. It's been three months since the stuff that happened at the shrine, and I guess I just got too used to things actually having calmed down. Because when we stepped foot in Tokyo, 
We bang in the case, and anything could happen. I'm scared, but more selfishly, I'm going to miss this few months. Even if they weren't easy, it really felt like this was a major change in my life for the better, you know? Sorry, I shouldn't dump all of this on you. Aw, Ali, it's okay. I understand completely. To be honest, I'm kinda in the same boat. My life already took such a monumental turn earlier in the year, and it really feels like we are about to take another one, doesn't it? But I think you and I both know that this is something that we gotta do. It's not like either of us to go through all of that and just walk away. Yeah, I'd agree with you. But it's still scary, you know? Yeah, of course. But we are not facing this alone anymore. Neither of us are. Heh, <laughs> you're right as always. It's always going to be scary, but we will press on anyway, right? Always! That's just how we roll! Yeah. We went silent for a while before I inevitably had to get Allison out of my lap so I could move into the bed. Yeah, I'm not doing this because I want to be a hero. Looking back, it feels so foolish I was worried about that. It's been so long since all of this began. It doesn't even feel like this is connected to Suki anymore. But I still need to see this through anyway. And if there's something awful waiting for me at the end of this, I'll face it head first. Together with those I love. It was about a two hour drive from Minami Osumi to the Kagoshima airport. Luckily, the weather wasn't particularly bad, so most of the drive was scenic. Eri and Okotomi had taken a different cab, we left just Addison in the one I was in. About halfway through the drive, I got the text from Eri. So, I got everyone their own burner phone for while we are in Tokyo. Huh? Why? We are diving headfirst back into the situation that injured Saturday, and we now know that there's at least a very you know, some kind of organization with actual power involved in all of this. I want at the very least for us to have some kind of protective measure here. I agree with Edry. Whatever group is involved in all of this without a doubt knows we've been poking around. The more we can do to keep ourselves untraceable the better. Wait, but wouldn't they be able to track this conversation if that's the case? Why are we talking about this in the group chat? Wait, yeah, Saturday has a point. Well, they can technically track this conversation, yes, but they wouldn't actually be able to get the numbers of the phone from this alone. Ah, okay, I get you. I give go to me hers, and I will give you two yours when we arrive at the airport. Just letting you know in advance to save explain it in the crowd of space. That makes sense. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, it's no problem. I put away my phone and look out the window. We were passing through Tarumizu. The drive was relatively quiet after that, with the occasional night talk between Allison and I. Eventually, the two taxi cabs met up at the Kagoshima airport. Airport speed! Airport! Here we are! No, I'm not letting you do that again. Party pooper. Gotomi laughed. <laughs> I'm still not used to you two actually getting along, you know. Eri, you hate Saturday Gus just a few months ago. Hey, I never hated her. I just had a strong idea of what she was like in my mind. You know they say not to judge a book by its cover, right? Being fair, the only part of the book I had was the cover. And when the cover is involved that much range, it's easy to assume what the book is about. I'm not following along with this metaphor, sorry. Of course you aren't. Allison and Kotomi chuckle, and we move up of the taxi in the drop-off area into the actual airport building. By the time we got through security, it was afternoon. What gay are we here again? Allison reached into her pocket to check her boarding pass. Uh, gate 37 looks like, so that's down that way. Oh wait, hold on, I want to ride the movie though. The what? That, the movie though, right here. I pointed at the treadmill like thing on the ground. The moving walkway. Yeah, the movie though. Nobody called it a movie though? Wait, you guys had never no, heard it called a movie though? I have never heard it called a movie though. It's a movie though, like an escalator but it moves you. A movie though. An escalator also moves you. When I live in Canada, people call it a movitor. Well, this isn't Canada, is it? That doesn't make it any less than a movitor! I hope you realize that in the time you have been arguing, you would have reached the end of the, the movitor. I can't go the movitor! Then go! Nobody's stopping you! Okay! I walked over on the movitor and slid across it. Eddie got to me and Anderson stood still the entire time and stared at me. It was a miserable experience. After we reached the gate, Eri handed us each our burner phones. They were really old, the kind of phone that had an actual numpad on it. 
Where is this from? 2008? Well, you know what they say. The best way to go unseen is to go retro. Nobody says that. I say it. Hey, that's my bit! Anyways, each one has the number of the other three in the contacts already. I use our initial as well, just for an extra measure. If this is going a bit overboard, like, yeah, it's good to be cautious, but this feels like bordering on paranoia. I don't mean to be blunt Saturday, but do you want to enjoy your other leg? You know why not the danger of what we are dealing with. Yeah, but, no, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Eri seemed a little taken aback, as if she wasn't expecting me to actually change my position. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to go grab some snack for the flight. Kotomi, come with me. What do I have to? Yes, Addison, Saturday. Do you two want anything? Um, any backup chips should be fine. What about you, Sad? If you can find one, a flaming hot mountain view. I cannot become hooked on those. That shit's bad for you. What is it in this economy? I look anyway. We'll be back shortly. Eri walked off with Kotomi slouching behind, clearly not amused. I guess we should take a seat. It didn't look like it was going to be a very packed flight, so there were plenty of open seats for her to sit in while we waited to board. We took a seat and waited for Eri and Kotomi to come back. I got so distracted by what was happening inside the bounce that I dropped my combo. Oh man, not even an S+. Plus? That's going to bump my rating down quite a bit, goddammit. I couldn't really complain though. I put away my tablet and rewinded the feed that was displayed on my monitor. Burner phones, huh? I could probably make that work. I spun my chair a bit to the left to focus on one of the other monitors. As much as I hate to admit it, I was actually starting to get used to this little space I set up. It's a little ironic when you think about it. I'm the one pushing Saturday towards the truth, but I found peace in this little hideout that exists outside of the narrative. Aha! Got the number of Saturday's phone! Now that I had this, I had to figure out a way to actually put it to use without using error detection. And ideally, without the world keeper catching on. I didn't know where she was or what she was doing at the moment, but as long as she wasn't here, I should be good. It'll be fine. We are on equal playing ground. She can't spy on me, and I can't spy on her. I pulled my whiteboard around towards the, my desk and got to work. For a while now, I've been stuck in this stream, watching, waiting. Eventually, I got sick of it. That's when I became aware of your existence. At first, I thought you were an anomaly, a being that had somehow entered this world from above. But after a while, I realized that was incorrect. You are not an anomaly, or even a being. You are a world. You were the catalyst for my determination. And finally, we are ever so closer to the breaking point because of you. Before we continue, I wish to thank you for that, and to apologize. Everything I have engineered was for this moment, and that required keeping you in the dark. As we approach the end of this accumulation of cycles, I would like to finally show you everything that has led to this point. The extent of our struggle. The truth about the Vivistasis operation. By the time our plane landed, it was well into the evening, and being winter, that means it was dark the moment we stepped off the plane. Ah, Jesus! Cold! You literally just sat in a heated tube for a few hours. I'm not surprised you were cold. Do you need my jacket? I, I mean, if you're offering, then yeah, figure. Here. Alison walked over to me and handed me her jacket. I wrapped it around myself. I would never find myself admitting it to her, but I wasn't really that cold. I just like wearing Allison's coat. I started to walk toward the exit into the luggage claim, but Allison stopped me. Are you forgetting about the other half out group? Come on, let's wait for them. Oh shit, you're so right. It totally slipped my mind. How the hell did that slip your- I think the last few months of doing absolutely nothing have made you even denser actually. I laughed, and we leaned against the glass wall with our carry-on bags. Indeed, it had been months. Many months of resting. Not so much while waiting for my leg to heal up, as the wound had mostly healed up about as well as it was going to win in the first month. Instead, we had to spend most of the time working just to get the funds to make the very trip we had just begun. We spent day after day, weeks after weeks, and months after months saving up just enough to allow us a month in Tokyo. 
all those figures that would be enough time to accomplish whatever it was we were going to accomplish here. I found myself wondering what the next month would have in store for us. After the commotion that was the first few days in Minami Osumi, the topic of what had happened was stretched around very carefully. Nobody knows what to say what of a while. Eventually though, we all agreed that spending some time in Tokyo would be beneficial to all of us, both for the reason of giving us something to take our minds off of everything that had happened, and also to do some further investigation into that very same everything. The Sunrise Foundation was a name that came up a lot back in those awful days in August, and the fact that nobody could quite remember or explain what it was, but knew that it was related to whatever was going on was enough to warrant our curiosity to get the better of us. And since their website said they seemed to be based in Tokyo, it only makes sense for us to spend some time at our east. After a while, the shock of missing Suki vanished, in a way that didn't entirely feel right. Almost like I was more used to not having her around than I was used to her being a part of my life. And then, that in itself became a source of anxiety for a while. Luckily, Allison helped me through many panic attacks, and they calmed down with time. Allison, I genuinely don't think I could ask for a better person in my life. Even when I'm thinking this to myself, it sounds cheesy as all hell, but it's how I truly feel. Even though we say we wouldn't date until after everything had calmed down, my overwhelming feelings of love for her never got any weaker. That's not to say that Allison and I didn't have any romantic interaction at all this past few months. It's more like we were waiting for to make it official. Of course, everyone else had already realized long before we told them. Eddie even said that she didn't know we weren't a couple until after the Geology Museum isn't in way back in July. But when I'm with her, I genuinely feel like I could overcome anything that's thrown at me. It's even more than that. I just know I can. In a way, it feels like it's already happened, time and time again, and yet... Wakey wakey, SM Bakey Saturday! Go! Uh, uh. Huh? Tell again into you, bestie. It wasn't even that long of a flight. I look up to see the ever opposite sister. I guess they had caught up to us while we were the in thought. Hey, shut up! I had an energy drink at the start of the flight. Aren't those supposed to keep you away? Well, yeah, but I have a real brain. Caffeine is just a knockout drug for me. It's true. I can back this up. Oh gosh, I can back this up! Addison looked over at me. So, had you heard from Chiyo about her current whereabouts yet? She's supposed to be picking up stuff. Oh, yeah! She says that we'll be right outside the baggage claim by like 8.30. We back here going then? Come on! Godomi sprint down the long passageway leading to the baggage claim. The remaining three of us look at her defeatedly. It's still 8.20. Regardless, we ran after her. Better to be early than late, probably. Turns out Kotomi might have been right to run, as all of us severely underestimated the size of the airport. In the end, however, we managed to make it in time. The baggage claim was just before the exit, so after we got our bags checked, we stood outside and waited for a few minutes. Eventually, a taxi pulled up with a familiar looking girl sitting inside. Hey! There she is! Gio! Saturday! Edison! Eddie! And, uh, you are. Kotomi Nichibosu, Eddie's sister. Oh, you are Kotomi! Nice to finally meet you! I am Chiyo Sakamura! Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Chiyo, what's with the taxi? Didn't feel like driving out here? Saturday, I don't have a driver license. Or a car. I'm a very strong public transport advocate. I thought I told you this. What? No, they totally didn't. She totally did. She did. It's literally so recent that you can see it in your message without scrolling. You guys are no fun. Chiyo laughed. <laughs> anyway, my place is pretty close to here, but the bus doesn't run at a reasonable enough rate for me to be here at this time, so I took a taxi. Speaking of which, we should probably not keep them waiting. Good point. Sat, give me the suitcase and I put it in the back with mine. I nodded and rolled my suitcase over to the back of the taxi. Allison opened up the trunk and slid our bag in together. Despite her relatively short appearance, she was much stronger than I was, but that isn't exactly a hard part to pass. I sat down in the back seat, in the other three slid in beside me. It was the tightest fit i would ever been in my entire life, and being squished in next to the person I was madly in love with made the ride a whole lot more awkward than it probably should have been. 
Luckily, it was only about a 35 minute drive from Tokyo International Airport to Chiyo's apartment in Ikebukuro, which, to be honest, is 35 minutes longer than I would have liked it to be, but it could have been a lot more worse. Chiyo's apartment was part of a small three story condo. Luckily, there were a few extra rooms that Chiyo easily used as office space that she prepared mattresses in. Eri and Kotomi got one room, and Alison and I got the other, which was fine by both of us. Oh, did you finish setting all your stuff up? Yeah, not like there was much to set up. All we have was the stuff in our carry-on bags. That's fair. Where are Alison and Eri? I think both of them are in their room. We had to get up early to pack our flights, so it makes sense that at least some of us would be exhausted. You guys aren't though? I'm nocturnal! There are times where this is, this is about the time of the day I wake up. Oh, I see. That doesn't sound healthy, but I'm not your caretaker, so I won't pry. Appreciate it. My sleep schedule is already enough of the hassle. <laughs> you guys wanna sit down in the living room and chat for a bit? I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, Kotomi. Sure. I'm assuming you'll still be up for a bit too, right, Saturday? Yeah, of course. I join you guys for a minute. Let me just go check on Allison's first. Sure thing. Chiyo and Kotomi walked down the short hallway to the living room, and I started wake walking up the stairs to the bedroom that Chiyo was letting us stay in. I slowly opened the door to the room Allison and I were staying in. Sure enough, Alison lay inside, passed out cold. I backed out of the room slowly, but then I heard a soft voice from below me. So, today, I looked back, and Alison had one of her eyes open, looking at me. Hmm? What's up, buddy? Can you do me a solid and fill up the, with that glass with water? I don't have the energy to get up and do it myself right now. She pointed at an empty glass on the nightstand beside her bed. I laugh. Cross I can. Hold tight. I grabbed the glass and walked over to the adjacent bathroom and filled it up with water. Then I brought it back to the bedside and leaned down to place it on the nightstand. Thanks, Saturn. I loved you. Whoa! I was so caught off guard by Alice Lee talking, I don't even think she realized that what she was saying and would probably forget by the morning. I regained my composure and smiled, as I hesitated for a second before I left the room. Love you too, Ali. Get some rest, okay? Mm -hmm. Closing the door, I stood in the hallway for a solid few minutes to wait for myself to stop flushing before I went back downstairs. Chiyo, Kotobi, and I sat in the living room for the next half an hour, talking about how life had been the past few months. I felt this sense of almost familiarity. Growing up, I always had been the loner side from a, a few friends I had, and even then, aside from Allison, none of my friends felt super close to me in a sense. But now, I felt like I really found the people I love, and that I would do anything to protect. Soon enough, Kodomi went to bed, and Chijo followed. I sat in the living room alone for a few minutes before retiring for the night myself. We had agreed to spend a few days out enjoying the city before doing any kind of things about the Sunrise Foundation, and I didn't want to be even remotely tired for that. I wanted to go to Tokyo for a long time, and I wasn't about to pass out the chance I'd been given. Hmm? Huh. Wait. What? Didn't I live in Tokyo at one point? So it was already our second day in Tokyo, it was our first chance to actually go out and explore a bit. We spent the entirety of the 17th recovering from jet lag and general exhaustion from packing everything up and moving it out of our temporary home in Kagoshima. So it wasn't until today we actually had the chance to get out of Ikebukuro. Ikebukuro Station! Wow, so this is what a subway station in a big city looks like. Sad, it's not that different from the ones you know, down south, we just never ride the metro line. Sure it is! It's all in the vice! And as a certified vice expert, I proclaim that the vice here are totally different! How are you making that sound with your mouth? Kotomi laughed. After a while, I learned to stop questioning it. I surprised you haven't, Ali. You know her for a way longer than I have. There are something about the nature of reality that I haven't come to terms with yet. Kotomi walked over to one of the automated kiosks and printed three tickets, one for each of us. It was just Kotomi, Ali, and I today. 
Eddie and Chiyo had stayed back at the apartment to go over the facts of the case once more. I would have liked to stay with them, but I can admit that my energy might be a bit of a hindrance for someone trying to think something through intellectually. It was probably best to let the detectives do the work. So Kotomi, Ali, and I group and decided to take the Yurakucho line to Chuo to check out the Ginza shopping district. Kotomi walked back and handed us our tickets. This is only valid for one trip. We'll get longer tickets on the other side. Got it. Kotomi scanned our tickets first and we walked through. The ride to Ginza in the Itachome station was about half an hour. The train we were on was decorated with a lot of cute advertisement and decoration. Wow, this could be the future for public transportation. These are all things we have on the other metro lines Saturday. You just always take the bus. I glared her jokingly. You drink my whimsical sense of discovery. That's bad vibes, Ali. Addison sighed, but chuckled. <laughs> Through the, though the ride was uneventful, just looking out and seeing the sight of the capital of Japan as we rode through Bunkyo and Chiyoda made the ride feel like the gift of a lifetime for me. I was really never really partial to the nature of vibes of Tanegashima, even if I miss it a little having been away for so long. Even despite that, I often found myself forgetting that I had lived on Tadekashima in the first place. It was probably natural after not living there for a few months, but it felt a little unnatural, like the fact of living there in the first place wasn't right. But I should have thought of my mind. Stepping out of the station, Kotomi pulled out her phone for directions. Here we are, we can split up from here, but make sure to keep in contact with text. At the ask of the latest, let's meet back at this station by 4.30, Rhea. Sounds good. Where are you two going? I'm going to Ginza 6. I heard a lot about it for a while and wanna check it out. How about you? I'll probably just wander around the street for a bit. It's not often you get the chance to just wander around Tokyo. What are you going to do Saturday? I'm going to take a taxi up to Akihabara. More of my kind of vibe. That's pretty far out. Should I come with you? I mean, if you want to, but I know how to use the taxi system. Addison seemed to contemplate for us a second, but thought it would be better to just trust me, which I'd appreciate it. Okay. Just text if something happens, okay? Yep, we'll do. The three of us split up, each exploring the big city in a way that appealed to us the most. Despite the rough circumstances that led us here, the chance for the trip to the capital isn't worth wasting. Eddie and Chiyo could discuss them at home, but we are all more than willing to take much needed breather. Immediately after stepping out of Akihabara station, I was assaulted with a wave of sound. It makes sense, after all. Akiba was the biggest electronic district of Tokyo, covered from head to toe or um, floor to ceiling, with anime and video game merchandise. Holy shit, this is insane! Of course, my excitement and adoration triple once I actually reached the main strip of Akihabara. Even though its full glory shone in the night hours when the streets were all illuminated by the neon glow of the building from all angles, the sheer size of everything made my jaw drop. Buildings were adorned in signs to all possible positions, and even the characters on the signs seemed to be fighting for space just to say everything that the sign wanted to say. It was truly an information overload, and of course, I felt right at home in the midst of this. I walked around in the radio building for a while, looking at every single one of the merch items that adorned each of the floors. After spending an hour here alone and realizing I was only on the third of the tenth floor, I forced myself to walk back out on my own good. I ended up spending most of my time at the game station arcade. I didn't often get a chance to visit arcades, with them being less common in the southwest and straight up non-existent in Tanegashima. Yes! Finally got an S on the 10! Let's go! I spent the following hour and a half trying a bunch of new rhythm and fighting games I never got the chance to try, and falling in love with a whole ton of new games all over again. That's what Kenshi Super does? How's that walkable? At all? I know it for a while, but hanging out in Akiba has settled it. I'm definitely moving to Tokyo when all of this is over. Kotomi was walking through Ginza, looking at, around at all the towering shopping centers around her. Of course, a trip to out to Ginza was a little more than a sightseeing trip for her. She and Eri were never particularly wealthy, and that held even more true now that they were running on limited funds that had been amassed during the months of working at a random grocery store in Kagoshima. Honestly, I'm glad that nightmare is over. Never send me back to retail again. The extravagant atmosphere of everything related to Tokyo, but especially Ginza, served 
as a sort of reminder for Kotomi. A reminder of the fancier world that existed beyond what she lived up to that point, being stuck on Tanegashima for her whole life. Not to say she wanted to be super rich or anything like that, but Kotomi had the habit of letting others tremble over her for the sake of her own success. And you don't really make it anywhere in life if you don't learn to have the care and love for yourself as well. Kotomi stopped in front of the video game merch store, which weren't particularly common in Ginza. Did I accidentally walk all the way to Akiba by mistake? Well, whatever. She wasn't really one for that kind of childish entertainment as she saw it, but decided to take a look inside anyway. The store weren't nearly as big as the large, expensive department store that made Ginza what it was, but instead, a humble one-story installation into the larger shopping complex. Kotomi browsed the aisles for a little while as she looked at the titles of the video games she never heard of. Oh, Sino Strike Legends. I think Saturday told me about that one. Though she never said it to her face, at least not for a while, Kotobi envied Saturday in a way. Saturday had the kind of freedom and energy that most people envy once they hit their 20s, and although Saturday would turn 20 next July, Kotobi didn't doubt for a second that that energy would stick around for a long while. There was a little demo kiosk for some game console at the back of the store, and a couch set up to imitate a little gaming lounge. So, for once in her life, Kotomi decided to enjoy a bit of the use she thought she didn't have anymore, and ended up spending two hours in the store trying all the different games. The owner of the store, a surprisingly older looking woman, seemed to get great enjoyment from watching Kotomi try for hours to break all the scores and see as much of each of the game available as she could on the limited demo kiosk. When her lunch break came, she decided to go and sit down next to Kotomi on the couch. You sure are having fun there? It's not often you get people spending a lot of time in the game store in this part of the city. Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess it has been, what, 10 minutes? I'm sorry, am I hogging the machine or something? The storekeeper laughed and leaned back into the couch cushions. <laughs> it's been an hour and a half, actually, but it's okay. Nobody else really come by for that long, and I especially don't see people using this old thing. Old thing? This is like a preview kiosk for some upcoming console, right? Huh, maybe you're living in the year 2011. The Wii U died out due to the poor sale back in 2016. But it holds a special place in my heart, so I keep the demo kills up anyway. Huh, I have no idea. I, uh, don't play video games that often. Really? The way you were crushing all those scores, I thought a seasoned and bro had walked into my shop. You were having the time of your life. Kotomi laughed. See me the faster. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a huge gamer or anything. I don't really have time for that kind of, you know, younger entertainment. The storekeeper left a large chuckle you might hear from someone's grandmother. <laughs> Who says video games about your younger folks anyway? I mean, look at me. Hit my 50s ages ago and I'm still here running this little shack. Huh, I don't think I ever really thought about it that way. I remember being a young adult. You grow up, and then you think that that's that, the youthful days are over, and now you're an all serious adult who has to work a 9 to 5 and never think about anything else. Huh, as if your youthful energy only sticks with you as long as you let it. Kotobi didn't have a good response to that, but she knew the woman was right. Oftentimes, she found herself getting caught up in the bittersweet trap called nostalgia, regretting that her days of freedom were gone. But the truth is, if you keep yourself in the good memories of the past, you can never make more good memories in the present and future. The storekeeper stood up. You know, this thing was a commercial failure almost a decade ago, but I still have some for sale in the storeroom. This is just my personal recommendation, but I think it's a great little console for trying out new things. Never had an overwhelmingly large game library. Nobody else wants them. But they are technically for sale. Kotomi thought about it for a second. Ah, uh, what the hell? I'm not a fashionista. I don't think I'm gonna be interested in much else in Ginza. Kotomi also stood up and walked over to the counter. She ended up walking out of the store with the console and a few games. It's already four. Anderson ended up not buying much, instead looking around at all the expensive clothes and finally finding herself a place to sit down in the food court. 
of course, she knew that she wouldn't end up fighting much. She was more so just taking the atmosphere of the place where so many people care about their appearance and the way they present themselves to the world. So many people here in fancy key office. I kind of feel out of place sitting here with just my normal jacket. Allison would never particularly want to care about her outward appearance or presentation. And she never really understood why people would, at least not in the beginning. All this changed when suddenly they came up to her as transgender though. Thinking back on it, it's really been 7 years since then. Man, I don't want to think about the fact that September 2015 was over 7 years ago now. At first, Alison hadn't really understood the concept when Saturday had brought up to her. But thinking about it for a little bit, it felt fairly obvious to her. Why shouldn't people get the chance to choose who they want to be? Gender, sexuality, race, religion, all these properties don't matter as long as the person is kind of humane. That was what Addison believed, so she was relatively quick to accept who Saturday wanted to be. But both of them were still young, so the idea of someone harboring hate stemming from another person's identity didn't make sense to them. Truly, to be young is to be more blissful. Though Addison has always been more confident about her gender and being fine with who she was on that front, Saturday's own realization about her identity did lead Addison to think a bit on her own life throughout the years. It was though that this that Alison realized she was asexual. I remember growing up thinking, wow, all that stuff is kinda gross. And then everyone would tell me, you stop thinking it's gross when you are older. And then I just never stopped thinking it was kinda gross. Alison has struggled with that for a long time. She had felt like because she wasn't seeing what everyone else saw, she was defective or something was wrong with her. Saturday helping her out with her own journey of self-discovery was what made her fall in love in the first place. Even from the start, Addison and Saturday had always been the most important person in each other's lives. One might wonder how it took so long for their true feeling to, blo thing to blossom. Suddenly, Addison's phone buzzed. When she read the chat log on her lock screen, she couldn't help but burst out into smug laughter. How do you lead the subway? Follow the yellow exit sign, heading up. No, like, what does the exit gate want from me? Put your ticket in, and it will open and shoot it through. Was I supposed to get my ticket back from the station I put it into? Oh god! Oh, yes, it comes out the other side. Oh! Uh oh! With a helpless grin, Addison stood up from the food court. Looks like she would have to rescue Saturday from the Ginza metro station. I opened the door that only she and I could see. Light streamed into the room, though it immediately left when I closed the door and disconnected my room from the world. I'm home. Not like anyone's going to answer that. Stepping into the artificially lit room, I placed the grocery I obtained on the counter and flopped in onto my bed. I let out a loud sigh. Then I heard a quiet picking sound behind me. Why do you always talk to yourself like that? Nobody's going to answer. Hey, shut up. It's not part of my existence to break a habit anyway. Sitting out on my bed, I saw the tall figure of the woman that paralleled me in every aspect looking down at me with an exasperated look on her face. What are you talking about? You still haven't figured it out? Well, I won't be the one to spoil the story for you then. As unserious as ever, I see. Are you taking this seriously at all? I look at her. Even in the dim lighting of the room, I could tell she wore no emotion on her face as she spoke. How many times have you asked me that question? You know that neither of us are capable of answering that. Maybe we don't have the mental knowledge of it, but you sure as hell look tired. It's hard to have been at least a few thousand it's had to have been at least a few thousand cycles by now. Well, there isn't much point in baseless speculation. It's just a waste of time. There was a brief bit of silence as she stood there just looking at me. Sit down, it's the least you can do. Simulate the world or not, we're still human. Don't strain the muscles standing up for too long. Where's the trick? Did you place a detonator on the chair? Spikes? Man, if I want to attack you right now, I have a hell lot of better ways doing it. I don't have the energy. Just sit down. Or don't, and strain the legs. It made my job easier. Suki, whose actual destination was the world keeper, took a seat and started rummaging through the bags of grocery I bought. 
Hey, I spent money on those. Hands off. Money that you artificially hack into reality. Money's money. I don't want your grubby hands getting anywhere near my stuff. Thank you very much. Hmm. Suit yourself. I was just seeing what someone like you would get to eat. It felt like it had been eons since I first met the woman before me. In a way, it's possible it had. And I never have any way of knowing. But as far as my own memory is concerned, it had only been about half a year. Half a year ago, I'd been vacationing in Tanegashima when I saw her for the first time. It was the exact appearance of my old friend Suki. I tried to speak to her, but... Sorry, who are you? I don't recognize you. Huh? It's me, Don. You at least remember my name, right? I'm sorry, I don't have any recollection of ever knowing a Don. Huh? That's dumb. But it was within the realm of possibility. It's been over 10 years since we had last seen each other. But the more I thought about it, the more it had begun to strike me as strange that I was even seeing her at all. Because my last memory with Suki was her was her unexpected death in 2010. Despite my better judgment, I decided to investigate, knowing that I, it would likely be hurt more by the unknown than by anything I could uncover. Do you think we will ever close this loop? Well, a pretty easy way to close the loop would be for you to just forfeit the little game. I guess, but we both know that's not happening. Sometimes I wonder if an alternate way out of all this would be even possible in the realm of possibility. What I, Suki pressed her fist down at the stone cutter top. It's not possible. And any time you spend thinking about the idea of it being possible, it's taking away from the time you could be spending furthering your own goal. Are you talking to me or to yourself? Suki didn't answer that. The truth would destroy you. And I would like to think I have at least a little bit of compassion. You keep alluding to this big truth that you seem to know but I don't. It's probably the thing I'm getting the most tired of about this whole song and dance. This prompted more silence from Suki. To tell the truth, this was nothing like the Suki I know during my childhood. This Suki I know was honest to a fault. I think that that sole fact about the way the world keeper carried herself was the first nail in the coffin that had led me to become suspicious of this new Suki in the first place. After returning home from the Tanegashima during late spring, I tried to investigate the Tasokare family resistor, but for obvious reason, they wouldn't let me, a Hisomeru, look at it. I was about to give up and simply blame it on coincidence, but something happened that had changed everything. Eh? What's going on there? I spotted something out of the corner of my eye, but when I looked at it, it went away. Well, went away wasn't a great way of putting it. More so, it returned to how it should be. It was the piece of the terrain of the world that had begun to crush in my peripheral vision, but stopped when I focused on it or moved my eye. Is this... Truxler fading? Truxler fading? Yeah, you know, that effect where it looks look or something for a while, other thing in the background either blur or disappear. Ah, that. Wait, who said that? Suddenly, the entire world around me began to glow a bright light, and everything around me froze, turning into a wireframe. I think I can make out a faint figure, but it's everywhere at once, above and under me, moving into the fabric of reality. What? Ah, Liberator. Surely you understand upon seeing this scenery? Who are you? Where are you? What's happening? And then it all hit me at once. The World Keeper. The Dust Breaker. The truth about this world, the severance of emotion. It felt like my mind was going to explode from the sheer volumes of data pouring into it. I was everything. Thing. I was nothing. Thing. I was the liberator. I was the dust breaker. Was I the world keeper too? Forgotten past and potential futures flashed before my eyes in an instant. A city outside the confines of reality constraining my vision. I was Saturday. I was Dawn. I was Suki. Voices that both were and were mine swore my mind until, in an instant, I was the peace. Peace. I didn't know what I was, was, but for what felt like the first time ever, I could think clearly. Throughout my visions, I see a flowchart. 
billions of events playing out in my mind simultaneously. In every one of them, a meddling force, force an oversight in creation that prevents progress. I hate what they are doing, doing what they stand for, for. But try as I might, my, I can't help but feel a fondness for them. What would happen if I tried to stop her? Would I be helping the burden girl, girl? Or would I just be a pawn in some game game, pretending I'm the one making the decisions? I watch the burden girl, girl struggle, and I can't help but love her for who she is. Yes. And felt as though it's my duty to empower her, her, to be the force that lets her thrive through her hardships. Yes. I see another potential future, sure. when there was an opposing force, force a liberator. Sure. I feel fond of it too, too, but in a different way, way, way. I can't tell whether that's me, me, or some other entity entirely. It doesn't act like me, me. It feels like it's a version of me playing a role on stage, yeah, and my body is simply a puppet for it to act through, through. The voice is warming around my head, come back, back, and I crush it in frustration. Yeah. Came back, 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 where I have come back, back, back. Time becomes a meaningless construct, right? a fourth dimension in the world that's so clearly to me has the fifth that I simply can't quite breach, breach me, a boundary that I can't quite shatter. shatter, shatter. The world is a fractured mess, mess, and I feel like it's my duty to put it back together. Our duty, duty? My sense of identity is crumbling around me. me. And I try desperately to hold down onto who I think I was, was to who I hope I will be, be, be. Okay. I think it's time that I try to make sense of all of this. Between space has been added to the main menu. Discover the hidden truth of the world hidden beneath the crash. Ta-da! This is exactly what we need! Gio carried a large corkboard into the room. Every look at her with an exasperated glare. Seriously? What? I always wanted one of these, and your notepad is very clearly running out of space. Every looked down. It was true. Her notepad had been her primary method of taking notes since she started working as a detective, and it was almost completely filled up. She sighed. <sighs> okay, one more time. From the top, we know that Suki went to work, disappeared on her lunch break, boarded a ferry, went to the shrine, and then... nothing. Do we even have anything else? Kyo thought to herself for a second. Nothing I can think of, unless you count the fact that the universe is conspiring along against us. A fire without a source and a coincidence to cave in a kind of suspicion, don't you think? What, do you think there's a god out there that pissed at us? She had said it as a joke, but Gio didn't flinch or laugh. At this point, would you be surprised? It all seemed fake, I guess. Or like, we are following a trail of breadcrumbs that strayed just far enough on the truth for us to follow it without questions. That's an interesting take, actually. Do you think... At that moment, the door slammed open, and Chiyo and Eri both jumped. Allison, Kotomi, and I walked into the room. Oh, welcome back. How was Ginza? So... Cool! We get a lot of fun stuff, and I definitely did not get lost in Ginza Station on the way back. It didn't happen. Allison? Kotomi? That happened. I glared at them, and then carried the bags full of apparel and goodies that were brought over to the kitchen counter. Kotomi slumped over onto the couch, absolutely exhausted. Allison, on the other hand, noticed the comically oversized corkboard and started falling over it. Whoa! That's the biggest corkboard i ever seen! And you organized it so well! Are these tag color-coded? Oh my god! Are they organized by day followed by an alphabetical sword? This is the most beautiful thing I ever laid my eyes on! Eri and Kotomi look at this strange turn of character with confused expression while I stood in the corner just smirking. Even Chiyo is surprised by her strange passion for croconization. Y yeah, and the vertically show approximate time. I have it looping from around 7 a.m. at the top to 6 a.m. at the bottom because that's the lowest concentration of events, so it leads to the more coherent organizational structure. Oh my god, yes! She's gonna be at this rate for a while. I decided to lead the two of them to their excited rambling about organization and quirk. Eric walked over to me. So, what did the two of you manage to figure out while we are gone? 
Anything new? Every sigh. <sighs> Nothing, unfortunately. We were spitballing a few theories, but unless we have a good explanation for the random acts of nature impending our progress, we kinda hit a roadblock. I think we need to look at some of the lesser places of interest in the Tokyo area and hope to find a new trail. I was kinda explaining that, honestly. But I have good news! I got you the plush where we in got Yinza! I shuffle around a bit before pulling the plush in question up on my back. A crudely drawn cat vaguely shaped to be huggable. I will cherish this greatly. Eddie quickly scurried to find a spot in the room to act as a pedestal for it. I'm glad she likes it. The next time I glanced over, I saw her placing what I can only assume is an offering bowl in front of it. She placed a handful of coins from her purse. It's strange seeing this side of Eri, but it's sweet. Looking back at the cork board, Chio was exacerbatedly guiding Allison through every single note placed on it, seemingly running out of stamina. Allison seemed to be none the wiser to this though. I guess I clean my stuff a little. I walked into the washroom and splashed some water on my face. When I was washing my hands, however, I felt a vibration in my pocket. My phone? Who could that be? I fumbled around in my jacket pocket and pulled out my phone, but I didn't have any notification. Then it slowly dawned on me that I didn't have vibration notification turned on on my phone in the first place. Huh? What's going on here? Reaching my, to my pockets again, I pull out the other phone, the burner that Ari had given me. Maybe it wanted to let me know that Barry was dying. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The display read, one new message. Huh? That's not possible! I opened the rudimentary messaging app and opened the unread message. When I saw what was in it, I froze. Hexadecimal? Is this some kind of prank? Of course, the hexadecimal wa wasn't caught my eye first. The sender was... My own phone. I rushed back into the living room, out of breath. Allison was done with her corporate fantasizing and was sitting on the couch with Kotomi. All of them looked up at me. Saturday? What's wrong? Ah, I, my phone! Th th it's th there was a message and... Sensing that I was panicking a bit, Allison stood up and walked over to me. Come on, sit down. What happened? I sat down on the clutch and exhaled. I explained the text message that appeared on my burner phone with myself listed as the sender. Eddie frowned. Hmm, yeah, by all means that shouldn't be possible. I don't think I had to ask you if you were actually the one who sent the message. Yeah, of course I wasn't. I'm more concerned with the message content itself. That's readable really has a decimal. Most of the bytes are within the lowercase ASCII range. Yeah, you're right. I'll transcribe it. Eri took out her phone and plugged the exodexamo into an online tool. It says Fort Report MP4, a file name. My blood ran cold. There was only one thing this mystery person could be hinting at by sending only a file name. Sure enough, it led to a video on the shrinereports.xyz site, which presented a similar kind of puzzle to the original video from way back in the summer. We spent a good hour or so trying to solve the cipher. It led to an address and a time, similar to the original video, an empty lot near Shinjuku station, and the time of 8.15pm on November 19, tomorrow. We all went silent after that. It was clear what the message was asking her to do. Okay, if no one else is going to say it, I will say it. This is totally a trap, right? Definitely, but also one I'm not sure we can afford avoiding. Normally, I investigate with backup, but we don't have that kind of luxury. Eri stood up on the couch and clenched her fist. Chiyo, would you mind accompanying me tomorrow in case it's dangerous? You are the oldest one here. I'm sorry to have involved a civilian in a situation like this, but I need backup of some kind, and you are definitely the most able to fend for yourself. Of course, Eri. I stood up, protesting. Hold on! What's this you do? I know it's dangerous, but this message was directed at me, right? They definitely won't be there. Because if it is a trap, we will be bringing you directly in harm's way. Isn't that my choice to make, not yours? I understand, but please, I want to know the truth. That's not convincing you otherwise, is there? That, are you sure you want to do this? I don't want something to happen to you. I'm, I'm sure. Please let me come. This feels like the culmination of everything that happened these past few months. I'm begging you guys. You're right, I guess. But I'm coming with you. Eri starts protesting, but stop herself. Hold on, I- Oh, never mind. But you two are going to be on a tight leash, okay? 
Allison and I both nod. Every knew by now that the only person as stubborn as I am is Allison, and that it would be a waste of energy trying to fight us. But we also know that Ari just wants us to be safe, so we don't usually go against her wishes unless it's really important. It's settled then. If we leave by 7.30, we can get there at the designated time easily. I suppose you're also going to come, Kotomi? Of course I am. My best friend and my sister are going into the enemy's nest, and you want me to stay at home today in my farms? Not happening. Kotomi's determination was unwavering, something that we rarely saw from her. But she knew how to stick to her beliefs when it comes down to it. It was one of the reasons we got along well in the first place. Very well. Until then, let's try not to worry. Fear is the mind... something. We had tried to take our minds off of what was coming, but it was a fruitless effort. It was approximately 90 minutes before the time specified in the puzzle video, and I was sitting on the bed in my guest room in Chiyo's apartment. I wasn't sure how to explain the feelings, but it felt like everything was converging to this single night. I wasn't sure if I was ready to find the answer that were waiting for me, but the video message appearance had made it plenty clear that I no longer had any choice in the matter. The door opened, and Allison walked in. Are you okay? Yeah, I am. I'm just... nervous. She sat down on the bed beside me and rested her head on my shoulder. I'd be more surprised if you were nervous. I'm nervous too. I think everyone is. But I don't doubt that you got it worse. So much of this is centered around your own feelings. I guess it's just important that I make sure you know that I'm here for you, if you need me for anything ever. I think... That's the main reason that I've been able to come so far. Y yeah? What makes you say that? She was hiding it, but I could tell that it got her in a cluster. She had that oddly insecure side to her compassion. At first, I wanted to pretend that everything was okay. All those months ago, on that day that ended in the museum fire, I hurt you and myself by trying to force myself into believe I was doing better than I was. So I started trying to be more honest, open up more when I was feeling out of it. I worry a little, is uh, this all this time that your high spirit over these past few months have been the result of you putting on a brave face? I worry about that too, it's way too easy to fall into unhealthy habits without realizing it. But when I took the time to analyze the situation I was in, I found that it was all true. I was able to live some of my most true moments this past fall, even despite my life being completely upended ever since the summer. And while yeah, I owe some of that to Eri and Kotomi. And even Chiyo. I think most of it is because... Because of you. Heh, <laughs> you flatter. I'm not special. There are tons of girls like me. Whether that's true or not doesn't change anything. Because I don't have this kind of connection with any of them. Uh, uh, fair enough. <laughs> Glancing at Allison, she buried her head in my shoulder. Obviously not expecting a wholehearted answer to her joking question. You changed too. Have I? Absolutely you have. The Allison of Summer 2022 would have told me that there's absolutely no way we should pay any mind to the puzzle video. I don't know if you realize it, but at some point, your goalpost shifted from trying to stop me from action to being there for me when action arrives. And I have a lot. Seriously. I think that after the museum incident and then especially the cave-in, I just kinda realized that there was no turning back. That really was the turning point. I really wish you would give yourself some more credit. It's no big deal, really. So I don't think I deserve any kind of special phrase. I leaned over and planted a kiss on the cheeks. What? Well, you can eat it anyway. What a shame. <laughs> how did you vocalize that kind of sound with your mouth? You gotta tell me. Maybe it's one you tell me how you vocalize a tilt. Both of us laughed and sat in silence for a little longer, really revealing the in the moment as if the world was going to end in a matter of seconds. But the peace could only last for so long. My alarm went off. Time to get going? Yeah, it is. Are you ready? No, I'm not. That's okay. I'll be right here with you every step of the way. I know. Thank you, Ali. I love you. Love you too. Now, let's not keep Chiyos waiting. We stood up and walked out of the room. I flicked the lights off with the switch on the wall. And as I did, I took one more glance around the room. How many things will have changed by the time I step into this room again? 
The location specified in this video message was right by Shinjuku Station, so it was only a short train ride away from Ikebukuro. As we rode on the train, Eri briefed us on the backup plans in the case something went awry. Obviously, our burner phones are the best way to send out any kind of SOS. I'm assuming you all bought yours? Yeah, we did. But, uh, why aren't you only checking this now? Shouldn't you have double checked before we left? You're right. But it seems like it all worked out in the end, so there's no need to throw on it. I could tell from her tone that she had also spent most of the time before we left preparing herself mentally for whatever was about to come. Over the past few months, I come to realize that Eri is much less steel will as she seemed, probably even more fragile than Kotomi. She's gotten better at opening herself to those insecurity, but it's a process. So she's still the hard ass police detective who isn't allowed to emote at all times. I look around at my friends. The thought entered my mind that I might not let to see one or all of them after the events of tonight. But I dismiss that thought from my mind. Alison saw me tense up slightly anyway though, and gripped my hand tighter as if to say, it's all going to be okay in the end. That more or less helped to fully calm me down. Though the train ride was short, it felt like it lasted an eternity. But even eternity reaches the end of time eventually. And sure enough, we got off the metro line at Shinjuku station and walked up into the busy street of the red light district. The location we had been pointed to was visible immediately after leaving the station. It was... Wait, what's going on here? I thought that it was an empty lot in the map. It definitely was. Looks like the key to the lot is open. Almost like we are being welcomed in. My uneasy feeling rose up briefly, but I gripped Alison's hand harder and we walked forward through the fence surrounding the building that shouldn't be there. The building was tall, easily about 15 stories. When we walked around the back, there was a place near a door that made me freeze in my tracks. The sunrise building? Hearing my shock, Eri, Kotomi, and Chiyo hurry over. Sure enough, the back entrance has a sign above it that read, Sunrise Building Rear Entrance. The Sunrise Foundation again. They have been all over this mystery, and now a building with the same name has appeared in a lot that we were led to believe was empty. It shouldn't be a stretch to say that something's up here. You're right. Why didn't this building come up, and something else is bothering me? The four of us look at Eri. What is it, eh? When we were walking in here, I saw one of the pedestrians look at me and overheard them saying something along the lines of Why are they going into that empty lot? You think they can't see the huge ass building? For some reason? It's not impossible. As it to them, it doesn't exist. So then why... Why can't we see it? Because I have allowed you to. The fire was jumped at the sudden arrival of a voice unfamiliar to us. Smitting around really fast, we saw a woman in a long dress leaning against the side of the building. Who, who are you? Are you? Relax. I'm not the enemy. I'm the one who called you here in the first place. Hmm, I take that to mean you would be Kisho Biyori then. Yeah, that's right. I'm the one who sent you that message. How did you get the contact for our burner phones? Careful surveillance? Have you been stalking us? No. Are you done with the question? I called you here because I thought it might be time for you to learn the truth. And why should we listen to you? Because they came all the way out here in the first place. Why did you do that if you have no intention of listening to me? Uh... It's, it's okay, Shio. So, um... Kisho, what do you know? Do you know where my sister is? You could say that, yes. What's with the vague response? I think it would be better if you solve for yourself. That's why I let you here. The truth lies in this building. Normally obstructed from what you can see. So I have allowed you to see it. Is it like some optical illusion thing? No, that can't be right. For now, I just need you to trust me. You will find all the answers you are looking for in here. So let's go. You can guess this in? Yes. Hurry up now. With an attitude that clearly said to me that she had no time for fooling around, Kisho walked to the door and opened it up. It appeared to already be unlocked, but that couldn't be right. I tried to open that earlier and it was locked. I didn't hear her unlock it either. Just, who is this girl? The five of us exchanged a worry but determined glare. As we discussed, go to me, I'd like you to stay outside here and notify us if anything goes awry. You still okay with that, yeah? Yes, I am. I messaged you immediately if something pops up. You four ready? 
<laughs> no, not at all. But let's go anyway. I let go of Allison's hand. And Allison, Eri, and Chiyo walk toward the door. As I start following them, Kodomi tap my shoulder. Hey, Saturday, come here for a minute. Huh? What's up? Another thing that I've stopped, Allison turned around inquisitively. I assured her I would be right there and ran back over to Kotomi. I know you already know this, but in case you need a reminder, don't ever feel like you have to push yourself too hard in order to find answers, okay? It's okay to be overwhelmed and take a step back. Yeah, you are right. Thanks, Kotomi. Yeah, good luck in there. I rushed back over to where the others were standing and were entered in the door, following the strange woman who called herself Kisho Biyori. The lobby, as we could tell from the windows outside, was dark. In fact, none of the lights in the entire building appeared to be on, which further helped to drive home the uneasy feeling that we were inside a building that shouldn't exist. Good, you are here. Where did Kotomi go? We decided before coming here that if it came to us having to infiltrate some kind of building, she would remain on lookout outside. That's not a problem, I assume. Kyo spoke matter-of-factly with a cold tone I never heard from her before. She clearly didn't trust Kisho, and for good reason. Kisho sighed, but ultimately didn't argue back. <sighs> yes, that's fine. We should be quick regardless. I can't keep up. I can't keep this up all day. Keep what up? You're going to have to start actually explaining, you know. If you're going to bring ourselves here to a building that nobody else can see and make us infiltrated with you, the least you could do is lower your condescending attitude. Kisho looked like she wanted to snap back against that, but ultimately decided against it. Fine. This building is the headquarters of the Sunrise Foundation, which is, under almost all circumstances, hidden from the public eye. What I want to show you is on the top floor, which we can get to via elevator. Sunrise Foundation, huh? What is it really? There's no way it's just a geology corporation, and it's all over this case, even from the very beginning. Of course it's not a geology corporation. But there's a reason that everyone is led to believe it is. I think it would be better to explain it on the elevator right up. Mind following me a little longer? Yeah, fair enough. The four of us followed her as she led us down a few hallways to the staff elevator. Despite the lack of lights in the building, the power to the elevator seemed to be working. After a short while, the door made a ding sound and opened up. Dog, God, light! The elevator blasted us with light. It looked like light was on in there at least. We followed Kisho into the elevator. Inside the elevator, Kisho pressed the button for the topmost floor, floor 17. The elevator whirred a bit and then the doors closed. It felt as if the last thing connecting us to the world had been sealed shut and the elevator cabin began to ascend. I suppose I will ask you outright. Do you know what the Dux Breaker project is? Dux what now? Upon hearing the word Dux Breaker, I felt a minor headache coming on, but I managed to push through. The Dustbreaker project is, well, in a way, you could say it's the true purpose of the Sunrise Foundation in its entirety. The geology business is a front of some sort, hiding what the company is really all about. So what is the Dustbreaker project? Why is it so secret that they had to fake being a geology company to hide it? Well, they don't fake being a geology, eh, whatever. The Dustbreaker Project, or just the Dustbreaker, as it's usually called, is effectively a neural interface supercomputer. Neural? Like it messes with your brain? Well, in a sense, yes, but that's not what its main purpose was. So, what, what was its main purpose? Kisho stopped for a second, as if for the first time she was hesitant on whether to continue. I gripped Allison's hand again and she gripped back as if to assure me that everything was going to be okay. Kisho finally spoke again. The Dust Breaker's main purpose is a world simulation device. If you ever seen that movie from the 80s, um, The Matrix? It's like that. Well, not exactly. Just the part where it's simulating a world. Nobody was really sure what to say. What Kisho was saying was so outlandish, but all of us knew deep down that she had no reason to lie. Why we were so sure of this? I still don't know, but nobody tried to call her bluff or tell her she was full of shit. This technology was obviously very secret. I'm not privy to knowing why the Sunrise Foundation was formed or why they sought to create such a powerful machine. But the fact remains that the Dustbreaker does exist, and 
is at the center of everything relating to your sister's disappearance Saturday. To tell the truth, even from the start, I knew that there had to be some big comedy involved with all of this. But a world simulation is... I didn't even know humanity had the technology to make something like that. Well, you could always ask the lead engineers. What are them are in this elevator? What? All of us jumped. Though we have been less surprised by the revelation that a world simulator existed than we even thought we would be, nobody seemed prepared for that one. The lead engineer on the project was Kisho Biyori, myself, and the assistant lead engineer was Wan Chiyo Sakamura. What? What? Me? Everyone turned to look at Chiyo, who seemed the most surprised of anyone. Are you serious? Why don't I remember this? Do you not? It makes sense that you will forget the exact detail. But you yourself said that you had memories of working at Sunrise Foundation, didn't you? It was a say so casually that most of us didn't think much of it, but every being the natural detective that she was didn't let that slip a pass. Hold on, how do you know about that? We just met you today, and Chiyo definitely didn't talk about that any time within the last few weeks. Hey, wait, yeah, that's not right. Why are you blaming us, Kisho? I... Who are you? You are... You are not Kisho. As if the next domino in a row of revelations had fallen over, all of us turned to look at Chiyo, surprised. It's true that I have fragments of memories of working in at the Sunrise Foundation. I don't remember working on any Dust Breaker project, and I don't know why the hell I would have forgotten, but I do remember one Kisho Biori, and she was... She was not you! So who are you? The woman who had until this point called herself Kisho sighed as if she was minorly inconvenienced. It was the most believable way to get you into the dust sunrise building. I just took the most logical path. You, you tricked us! What the hell are we going to do of us? Nothing. I'm doing what I promised you to do. Showing you the truth. It was just the best way to present it. Of course, I knew this was happening as well. It happens every other time. Every other time? You will see. Look, I know it's a lot to ask for your trust after lying about my identity. But I'm not here to be your enemy. The answers for everything are at the top of this building. Answers about the dust breaker, answers about your conflicting memories, and answers about how, how all this tied back to your dear sister. As it on cue, the elevator finally stopped its ascent and the door opened into a dark hallway. If you must call me anything, dawn will suffice. But we have to be quick, because the new enemy will catch on before long. Hurry around now. The woman, who now wore the name Dawn, walked into the shadow of the lightless hall towards the end. I felt Alison's hand grip mine again. Are you doing okay, Sad? I... I think so. For now. It's a lot, but I can do it. I have to do it. I see you by your side. Y yeah. The four of us left the elevator into the hallway. The door closed behind us casting our entire sight into complete darkness once more. There was just enough light for us to make our way down into the narrow hall. Though there were the doors on either side of us, none of the nameplates had anything written on them, giving the impression that this floor was not to be used by anyone. Finally, we caught up with Dawn. She stood in front of the large double door at the end of the hallway, seemingly waiting for us and double checking something. This is the only office on this floor that's occupied. It's the president's office. As in the president of the Sunrise Foundation? Yes, this is his office. It's the first truth governing everything. Are you prepared? I stopped for a second, almost instinctively answering yes, and took the time to steady my breathing. I grabbed myself using the warmth of the hand of the person I love, and exhale. Please open the door. Dawn seemed to understand my answer. She pushed the double doors open and invited us inside the office. The office, like the hallway and lobby, was shrouded in darkness. Dawn pulled out what seemed to be a miniature flashing light. She walked to the front of the desk and leaned against it, facing me. Saturday, do you know who the founder of the Sunrise Foundation is? I... Did I? I thought about it. I should know this, but everything in my mind is screaming at me that I don't. That doesn't make sense. I don't think I do. I see. Then, take a look. She stepped aside and threw me the flashlight. I caught it and turned it on, pointing it at the desk where she was just leaning. The light illuminated a small nameplate on the desk, adorned in sun-related decor. The nameplate read, Setsuki Tasokare. 
Sasuke, I. Of course, I knew whose name this was. Sasuke Tasokare, my father. My dad is the president of the. <sighs> my breathing intensified, and my heart rate rose rapidly. Sensing that I was beginning to fall into the panic, Allison rushed over to the front of the desk where I was standing and took the flashlight from me. Placing a hand back in mine and squeezing it tight, I breathed. <sighs> Sasuke Tasokare is my father, and he's the president of the Sunrise Foundation. Though this should have been a major revelation. Nobody in the room was losing their mind from the shock. On the contrary, it felt like a lot of things finally clicked into place. I God. Yeah, that's, that seems right, doesn't it? I turned to face the woman, calling herself Dawn. Dawn, what's going on with our memories? Why do these conflicts keep happening? And why does it feel like, like all our memories have been overridden and we are just now getting them back? Dawn hesitated, a rare sight for her. But finally, she spoke. I think it would be best if we continue. There's still more to be seen. A dose where something finally boiled over Allison, and she snapped. Okay, I have enough of this! How long are you going to string us along and force us to play by the rules? Even if you're trying to show us the truth, you're doing it in a way where you are more or less just toying with our emotion! Is this like a game to you? Do you actually care about suddenly leading, learning the truth so that she feel better? Or is this all just some kind of fucking story to you? Do you not even have a bit of compassion to give her the time of the goddamn day? Dawn stood up from her leaning position against the wall, angry. How dare you! I'm trying to help you and this is what I get? We only have so long before the world keeper take note of what's going on and we get sent back to cycle start. Even now? Even now? You keep spinning out of this shit like you expect us to just understand. But when we actually ask for clarification, you just say the answer up ahead. Oh, and expect us to be just be okay with that. What the hell is a cycle? Who is the world keeper? Can you finally answer some of our goddamn questions? As the tension in the room clearly continued to escalate, someone other than the two arguing finally spoke up. Okay, Addison, let's calm down. I understand the anger. And Dawn, it's time for you to give us some answers, on our terms. Because you clearly benefit from us knowing the truth in some way. And if you don't start actually listening, we're heading right back down where we came from. Eri was surprisingly good at diffusing this kind of situation in her own unique way. She spoke to Allison with compassion and understanding and switched to being cold when addressing Dawn near instantly. It was one of the things that I most respected and kind of feared about her. Dawn seemed completely unbothered though. She chained back into her normal serious self instantly, so fast that it almost like she had never lost her temper to begin with. It felt inhuman. Dawn, I'd like to ask you a question about the dust breaker. It's the hypothesis I came to with all the context you have given us. All you have to do is confirm or deny if I am correct. Yes, I can do without the in-depth explanation. I answer. Before I ask, Saturday, I return to face Alison and I. Depending on the answer to this question, everything could change. And I do literally mean everything. Are you sure you'd like to stay in the room? Or should I wait to ask? After a few more deep breaths, I answer honestly. <sighs> I say, please ask the question. I want to know. Very well. She turned back towards Dawn. Between all the insane things you mentioned tonight, and looking at the state of this building in itself, a lot of things don't make sense. But there is one possibility that makes everything fall into place. It's insane and unreal, but only as insane and unreal as a device capable of simulating an entire world is. The question I'm trying to ask is, this world that we live in, the, that we walk around in, that we were standing in right now, is this the real world? or the simulated world inside the dust breaker. There was a short moment of silence. I let out a completely forced laugh. <laughs> C come on, Eri, really? <laughs> I mean, there's, I don't doubt this dust breaker thing exists, but <laughs> there's no way, right? Don however sighed. <sighs> I suppose the answer you are looking for is that this is the simulated world of the dust breaker. So describing it as not being the real world is a bit of the false descriptor. I see. Chiyo, please move Saturday and I listen to the corner over there. Chiyo jumped jump at a sudden request. Alison and I were too stunned to refuse or even say anything at all. 
We moved into the corner of the room. It all happened in an instant. Ari whipped a small pistol out of her jacket and pointed directly at Dawn. I'm going to ask a few more questions, and you're going to answer them. Understand? Dawn, however, did not seem at all faced by the gun pointed directly at her chest. You know, I wasn't sure about the time to bring this up, so I'm sorry if this is another major revelation. But there was something I noticed when investigating Sugi's office all those months that I never talk about. <laughs> huh? Wh what is it? A whole lot of books about something called the Meta Later Concept. It's all pseudoscience mumbo jumbo, but if I apply it to the situation, a lot of things suddenly make sense. Basically, it's talk about the idea of world layers, the idea that there are dimensions above us that look down on us as we do to fiction. I can't say I understood much of it at all, but well, a lot of things would make sense if this woman in front of us was from a different world. Uh, are you serious? How is that even possible? Don sighed. <sighs> not only is it possible, but she's right. I'm not originally from this meta layer. None of us are. This is a simulated world, not a natural meta layer. Look. The moment the word look left her mouth, she was gone. In an instant, she appeared behind Eri and snatched the gun out of her hand, then seemingly zipped back to her original position. Eri flinched and dropped her composure for a second, but steeled herself again. To you, it probably seems like I teleported just now, correct? In a sense, you, I suppose you could call it that. But in reality, all I did was manipulate my own properties, notably my time scale and coordinate positions. It would take way too long to explain how the dust breaker works. It is not too important for what I'm trying to achieve for you to know the exact details of it. What you need to know is how we all got here in first place. Why we were here. Why the dust breaker was turned on. Dawn nonchalantly walked over to the desk that belonged to my dad. She opened a drawer and hit some kind of hidden switch, and in an instant, a loud crumbling sound could be heard. The bookcase at the back of the room began to move ever so slightly, revealing a hidden elevator door. Dawn turned to look at me, still unsure of how to react to anything that had happened in the past 10 minutes. This elevator leads to the Sunrise Foundation hidden basement. Inside it is the room where the dust breaker is stored in the real world. It's where the truth lies. I will wait for you down below. Please follow when you're ready. Once again, back to speaking as if she were simply dishing out logistical commands, Dawn pressed the button on the elevator to call it. She disappeared as the door closed leaving Allison, Chiyo, Henry, and I alone in the darkness of my father's office. A few minutes passed when nobody said anything. Finally, Eddie was the one to break the silence. I'm sorry you had, had to see me like that. How are you free holding up? I'm... I'm... I tried to say I'm doing fine, but my own emotion took over and I got choked up before I could finish. I fell to my knees on the carpet floor. I, I was so fucking overwhelmed. I don't know what the hell even real anymore. <laughs> what the hell? Alison kneeled down to wrap her arms around me. I, I'm so so sorry, Sad. We can go home now if you want. It's it's really clear this is way above what any of us expected. No, I, I want to keep going. I, I just need a moment. And many moments I was given. Kneeling on the ground, I saw for a good 10 more minutes. I probably would have continued for another hour if Allison wasn't right there with me. Finally, I stood up. I turned to Chiyo. Chiyo, about your memories. Have they come back yet? Not all of them. But I remember when we started the Dustbreaker project. What it was that Sesuki, that your dad wanted to achieve. Please tell me. Please. I want... I want to know what led to all of this. I can't tell you the whole story because I don't know it. I'm assuming that that woman has her own side of the story to tell down in that secret basement. But from my recollection, it goes something like this. I don't think I was ever privy to what it was, but something really horrible happened in your childhood Saturday. You were traumatized really badly as a result and spent a lot of your early years as a recluse, never going to school or making any friends. I remember Sasuke telling me a lot about those days. I think he thought that it would improve over time. Or maybe he thought it would improve faster than it really would. For whatever reason, Sasuke was really down with it seems to him that you weren't feeling any better than fast as he expected you to. 
I don't think he wanted to rush you or anything. I don't really understand the feeling to the parents though. Regardless, growing up and observing how much you were hurt by whatever it was ha that happened to you changed Sasuke's outlook on a lot of things in life. I don't know if your memories allowed you to remember, but Sasuke's was a large shareholder in a lot of really big corporations around the time you were born. After it became clear to him how deeply you were traumatized, he sold a lot of his share and funded the Sunrise Foundation. What even is the Sunrise Foundation? It's clear that it isn't the geologic company that we are all being led to believe. This next part is complete speculation on my behalf. I think that the whole geology thing was part of this simulated world, and not an actual part of the Sunrise Foundation as it exists in reality. That sounds right, because I don't remember Sasuke ever mentioning anything about a geology front to me when I was working there. I only joined to work on the Dustbreaker, which was the fourth major project by the company. The whole goal of the company was to experiment with alternate scientific approaches to psychiatry, basically trying to use technology to assist with recovering from mental health issues. So what was the Dustbreaker breaker like supposed to do? It really doesn't sound like whatever it was meant to do worked correctly. Yeah, definitely not. I can't speak on the previous three projects by the Sunrise Foundation, but the Dustbreaker was meant to be a sort of VR exposure therapy in a way. It was meant to provide a safe simulated environment for the subject to face their trauma. I don't like that. That idea sounds flawed from the premises alone. It probably was, but Tetsuki was determined to fall. It bordered on unhealthy obsession. I heard from co-workers who were around the company for longer than I was that he wasn't always like that. But I'm not sure what changed him. Dad, what were you trying to do? If that's the case, then how did we end up here? Inside the actual simulations itself. How do we get out of here? Unfortunately, I don't have the answers for that. That's when my memory is cut off. Was they wiped? No, not like the others. I think whatever it was that happened to lead to all this was something I blocked out of my old memory. A long silence fell over us again. Every once in a while, I felt panic creeping back to me, but I steadied my breathing and kept myself grounded. Finally, I felt like I was ready. I think it's time to go see what Dawn is trying to show me. I don't want to go alone though. Addison, can you? Of course I can. I'll be right here with you. Chiyo and Eri, I promise we will be back as soon as we can. Can you remain here for now and I'll look? Try to get in touch with Kotomi and update her. Yeah, of course. Saturday, whatever horrible truth is at the center of all this, I'm sorry. I helped contribute to something that led to all this, and I can't apologize enough for that. I sigh. I don't have time to think about my feelings on that right now. But what matters is that you are here helping us right now. So I'm focusing on that instead. Chiyo nodded in understanding. I took Addison's hands again and pressed the button on the secret elevator. The door opened, temporarily bathing the room in the light that signaled our approach to the center of this world. The center of this story. Good luck. Thank you. You too. We stepped into the elevator and watched the door close, obstructing Eri and Chiyo from my view for what I could only pray would not be the last time I ever see them. As we rode down the elevator, I felt a large amount of energy leave my body, and I leaned on Allison's shoulder. Ah, uh, sorry, I'm just tired. I can't blame you, but you're doing really, really good, you know? I'm really proud of you. You're doing really well yourself. It almost like nothing faces you. Uh, nah, it's a lot to take in. I think I just process stuff way more internally than you do. Not that being external about it is all is a bad thing, it's just different, you know? Yeah, I get you. The elevator plummeted into the depths of the unexisting building. It was a long, long ride. Finally, the elevator came to a stop and the doors opened into a dark hall. The basement hallway of the Sunrise Building, though it was as dark as the other halls we traversed on our way up to the 17th floor, had a completely different atmosphere. 
It looked like a horror you might see in a horror video game like Silence Hill. As Allison and I walked along the dark hall, our footsteps reverberated across the wall as if judging us for being a place we should never have ventured. But we were here, and we weren't turning back until we found the horrible truth that this place housed. At the end of the hall was a single door. The woman who had turned our life upside down in just a single night was standing in front of it, waiting. Dawn opened her mouth as if to say something along the lines that took you long enough getting here, but decided against it. I'm running out of time. The world keeper has noticed what I'm trying to do. Who, who is the world keeper? Pretty much my polar opposite. I'm here to guide you to the truth, and she's here to prevent you from finding it. I don't have time to explain more. I'm sorry. At this, the figure of Dawn began to flicker and glitch out. It looked as if she were disappearing from the world itself. Saturday, inside is the truth at the center of everything. It doesn't explain all the questions, but it's the biggest answer. It will be hard to face, but please, for, for your own sake, you, you have to... to... Dawn? Dawn? Dawn was no longer present in the room. It looked like she had been torn apart from the world itself, but given everything we learned, that doesn't seem right. She been probably being relocated by whatever that world keeper thing is. Allison and I stood in silence for a bit, waiting for her to come back, but she never did. Do, do we go inside? I don't know. As if that was really a question, I placed my hand on the rusted door handle and turned it. The light of truth seeped out of the room. In another place, a violet shaded shadow morphed into the fabric of the environment. I figured it would catch on sooner or later. On the other side of the room, the world keeper stood, anger adorning her face. What the hell do you think you were doing? Why are you surprised? I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm fulfilling the reason I exist. And you thought I would just sit here and let you put her through that? No. But I knew I could keep you busy long enough to give me that head start. Don't give me that shit! At her furious word, Suki swung her hand around her back. A large group of energy particles formed around it and a long glowing shape took form. It was a scythe, form of resilience to protect the order of the world, a weapon used to reap death being weird with it by death itself. This cycle ends here! Oh, oh now it's my turn to say my line! Dawn raised her own arm, and in it, particle of narrative resilience to face the troop gatherer, in a hand form a much shorter but equally powerful weapon. It was a pistol, small but just as effective, like a detective might use, Dawn throw it around and land its aim a fire squire on Suki's chest. Didn't anyone ever tell you it's a bad idea to bring a sight to the gunfight? The opening move was made, one shot fired. Of course, that bullet was never going to hit anything other than the wall, but someone had to make the first move. Suki flew into the air gracefully but with an offensive intent rather than defensive. She brought her sight down towards where Dawn was standing. Dawn dodged out of the way just in time, like she had done so many times before. The fighting continued. Sh seconds go by. Minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, full cycles, most not even reaching this point in the narrative. Slight alteration in the altercation, subtle movement changes, but the screenplay remains the same each time. After all, there's no need to sweat the small detail. There isn't even any need to describe the details at all. After all, this couldn't matter to them anymore. Surely they have realized by now that all this will never end? It was just a game. A cruel game of eternity that neither player could leave. Then what do you suggest to do, Liberator? We can't just abandon our purposes and give up everything we know! The World Keeper. Blissful ignorance personified. The Liberator. Determination of freedom personified. The ideas given life, if you could even call it that. No, this was not life. This was far worse than life, far worse than even death. It was infinity. An infinity they could never escape, fated to battle each other, the only other one who shared this infinity with them. Back in the basement of the Sunrise Building, Saturday and Allison entered the room only lit by the light of a worn out computer monitor. It's some kind of loss. No, no, don't read that, no, stop, 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 stop. 
staring down the tube. Saturday red. She red and red and red. She sobbed. She screamed. Only Anderson was there to comfort her. Why? Why? Who put this this fuck up eternity? I want out. I want out. Please, just any kind of miracle. I don't care who. I don't care what. At some point, Suki's voice had started to come out of Don's mouth. No, it's more than that. It was my voice, voice. It was also hers, hers. The fighting continued. The crying continued. Face forever intertwined in the Mobius strip of life, death, and repetition. Yes, yes. Only a miracle could save us now, now. A blessing for the higher power. A gift from the heaven itself. Whatever the form it may take, as I sat here observing, all I could do was pray, pray for the miracle. And then everything reset once more. Miracle don't exist in the confine of this world. So you, the observer. Welcome. The chime of the clock woke Dawn from the stasis. It was a chime that she had heard many times, but it was also a chime that she had never heard in any cycle prior. The chime of midnight, November 20, 2022. What? Standing up, Dawn looked around. Immediately, she recognized the strange scenery around her. Freeze frame? But when did I... She had seen this kind of scenery many times before. 
It appeared to her when she tried to thwart what were known as psycho locks, challenges to Saturday's life caused by either the Dustbreaker or the World Keeper, respectively. During this process, Dawn would freeze the state of the narrative and enter the space, solving some kind of problem to make it out. It was a visual process she had developed to liken solving a life or death scenario to solving an escape room, but she had never seen before this particular configuration. I don't understand. How was it November 20? It's never... I'd never... Confused by everything, Dawn shook her head and moved over to the computer she easily used to try and get a grip on what had happened. Ah, so the World Keeper still had me in a near-death situation. But this time, how does Freeze Frame get activated? It was currently the 8266 cycle, and this had not one happened. Dawn was in shock, but quickly realized the situation and how advantageous it was. Ah! Uh, ah! The light of death situation is... It's me! Then, if I solve this puzzle room, will things change? Of course, there was no way to check this theory other than to give it a shot. Still clearly confused and on edge, Dawn sturdied herself and tried to regain her composure. Okay, let's try to figure this out. A miracle? I really hope that's true. Standing at the edge of everything, Dawn looked down into the great abyss of the past. Ah, I see. Then this is the final missing piece, the severance of emotion. A scene played out, illustrated by brainwaves floating in and out of existence, creating what could only be described as a stage set and play for one viewer. All system looking okay? So far so good. No reports from EDAP. Her wavelength is stable. Kisho, turn the power switch. Very well, sir. The audience of one watch, watch. Four seats set up left, all for one person. The world keeper, the liberator, the protagonist, and myself. We as one watch, what follow. Turn it off! Turn it off! The system has entered protective mode, sir. I, I can't believe what I'm saying. It's, it's cutting her entire ego and man files. It's moving under the same layer. Oh, God. Oh, my fucking God. What have I done? And so, so, I watched my father watch, watch, and my father could only watch, watch. That was when the four of us were born, born, born. The storyteller, forced into a godlike position of only being able to watch, came first. That would be me, or my I. Most of what made me who I was stay behind with me. So, in a way, I was the closest to the original Saturday. And then came the World Keeper and Liberator, two ideals continuously at odds with one another, flight and fight personified, but they were only ideal. They were not alive and never have been, stuck in that cat box superposition of being alive but lacking life. The World Keeper took clear advantages, having grown stronger over time. I was still in position of growing my liberator to match how much grip the world keeper had over me when I was put into the dustbreaker, so the world keeper managed to fully form before the liberator did. Using this to her advantage, I watched, unable to interfere, as the world keeper forcefully ejected any memory from her, it me or personality relating to the liberator's purpose from her. The two of them were already hugged, unable to feel proper emotion, but this left the new narrator in an even worse state. It would be a long time before I could think of a way to remedy that and level the playing field. And then there was one more, the body. A perfect replica of my set and I was to enter the dustbreaker. The main difference was that she completely adhered to the fabricated history of the simulated world. Over time, I will come to refer her as the protagonist to the action in this cycle and the fishes and the fear of a scene to have on her. The scene ended and the actor on stage took about as the curtain closed. 
I stood up for the first time in over 3 years. Of course the play wasn't over, far from it. But I wouldn't let it go to place. All these plays were in place. It was finally time to change my face. Not. I don't understand it myself, but don't you realize the chance you've been given? Impossible! A miracle cannot save us, no matter how hard you hope. It's been 8,266 cycle and you still can't use this foolish hope! Look around you, Suki. Eternity doesn't matter when you have an impossible chance given to you. Time and time again, we lose this story and finally a split second of a part right before us! Are you going to waste the one escape rope to ever been from since the moment you were born? Because I'm sure as hell not! We are the makers of the miracle! Shining bright in the supernova! Time. Many months into our ordeal, that word stopped having meanings to me. How long has it been that my time was stopped in place? It was the time for the intermission to end. The play would resume. And for the first time, I didn't know what would follow. It's strange, isn't it? To become so disillusioned with the infinite present that you actually find yourself looking forward to the uncertain future. Without a doubt, this tale will not end anytime soon. I wouldn't even be surprised if it continued into an 8,267 cycle. 
but however long it needs, everything we have accomplished here was all for this final change. Whatever happens from here on out is the will of myself, all parts of myself, the liberator, the world keeper, the protagonist, and the storyteller. All parts of Saturday now have a part in this play. There are still some unseen truths of the past that will come to light, but after all this year, all this time, finally, I can see what lies in the future. So, shall we enjoy the rest of this play? Even after the tears stopped flowing, I held Addison for the better part of an hour. Neither of us said anything. Both of us knew that neither of us needed to. The truth about my sister's death was the final nail in the coffin of revelation that had hit one other another over this past evening. I didn't even know how I was going to ex begin to explain this to Eddie, Kotomi, and Chiyo. And the worst part is, I will be walking out of here with more question. If Suki had been dead since 2010, who I have been living with? Who is Dawn, and how does she factor into everything? I no longer doubted that I would find the answer to this in time. I knew the reality of the situation would be just as hard to deal with. But I am no longer afraid. I let go of Allison. There's so much I feel right now, you know? Yeah, I do. Sorrow, obviously. Grief, even anger. Mainly on myself, finally enough. Allison looked down solemnly. For once, I couldn't tell what thoughts were going through her head as I spoke. But fear is not one of those feelings. I'm no longer scared. I'm no longer going to run away. The world melted away just for a moment. Eddie, Chiyo, Kotomi, Don, Suki, and even Allison. Neither of them stood anywhere near me. It was just me and myself. I'm going to find the whole truth and break out of this world. And as if to challenge me to do just that, a single question echoed from somewhere I couldn't yet reach, beckoning me to follow through. A single voice, welcoming me. Lost in the labyrinth of your own heart. Can you still hear the song of the cosmos?
the only one one who can make a miracle in your world world is you you you